You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? There we go. Matthew chapter 25 is where we are this day. Matthew chapter 25. And this morning we'll be looking at verses 1 through 13. Matthew chapter 25. And we begin reading with the first verse. Then the kingdom of heaven may be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, saying, No, There will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we have had the privilege to sing together and to lift our hearts and voices to you in thanks, And with our desires, even our desire this morning that what we've just prayed through song should be answered, that your word would go forth and your glory would be revealed and the lost would be saved. And we, your people, Lord, our hearts would be satisfied. All these things are desires that we have because of your goodness and kindness and love to us in your Son. As we have sung together, Lord, we reflect on your goodness to us throughout the entirety of our lives, even to this very moment where we worship together as your people. This is not our own doing. If you had left us to ourselves, we would have perished. But you had mercy upon us and you brought the gospel to us and you opened our hearts to receive the things that we were hearing and you, by your spirit, granted us new life repentance and faith in your son granted us forgiveness of our sins and the very righteousness of Jesus and we are now accepted completely in the beloved before your presence we rejoice in this and we give you thanks and now as we turn our attention to your word it is our desire as we have prayed through song that the glory of Jesus would be put on display in your glory as God our Father would be put on display and that your spirit would take your sword in hand and deal with our hearts in a way that is unexplainable apart from the living God. Lord, help us to preach, help us to listen and do your work in the hearts of men and women, young people this day. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, throughout this Olivet Discourse, our Lord has been exhorting His disciples to be awake, to be alert, to be ready for His second coming. And of course, as He teaches this to them, they're not fully aware of what they're hearing. They're not fully grasping what they are hearing the age that we live in today, this, this age between the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Christ, the church age, this is something that was a mystery, uh, not unveiled in the Old Testament, but now brought to light with the coming of Christ, and the birth of the church, and the revelation that's been given after Jesus ascended into heaven. We understand these exhortations better than the disciples did when they first heard them. And of course, what we're hearing even applies perhaps to people beyond our own time. These words will be applied directly by those who are alive when Jesus returns from heaven. Yet they've been recorded and preserved for us throughout the ages. This is for all of us because we are all called to remain awake until Jesus returns. Over the last two weeks, we have seen exhortations to stay awake, and we've seen the descriptions of the kind of life that is awake. Last week, we saw that the alert life is a life of faithfulness. The alert life is a life of wisdom. We're, we're living our lives today, numbering our days, as Psalm 90 says, living in light of the end of all things. This is the wise life. Living our lives with the right sense of self-identity. We are slaves of the Most High God. Yes, we are the children of God, but we serve the one who has saved our souls and made us his family in Christ Jesus. And so we are striving to live lives that love him and are loyal to him until we see him face to face. Perhaps what we have seen emerge from this teaching more than anything else is the fact that this life of being awake and this life of love and loyalty is the product of regeneration. Throughout this discourse, Jesus is again and again talking about the consequences of not being awake. And those consequences, if we're hearing Him rightly, those consequences are really describing the difference between people who are saved and people who are lost. In each case, the consequence of not being awake is damnation. We'll see it again today. Which tells us that the, the life of being alert and awake is the product of being saved. As I said last week, it's not to say that we're always as alert as we should be. It's not to say that we don't go through seasons of our lives where we become spiritually sleepy and lazy and have to be shaken once again, to be alert once again. It's not to say that we're always as alert as the Lord would have us to be, but it is to say that we are a people who are looking for, if we're saved, looking for the return of our Savior. And we long for that day and we look for that day. So that being awake, the, the desire to be found faithful when Jesus returns, this is because we are born again. And people who are lost and living their lives in step with this world, the reason why they live like that is because they really lack the faith. They are absent the faith that Jesus is ever truly returning. They may verbally affirm that Christ is coming again. They may have it on their doctrinal statement, but their life reveals they don't really believe it. They live as though He's never going to come back, as though they're never going to meet with eternity. We saw that last week that the life absent the faith of the return of Jesus is a life that is selfish. People live abusing others and indulging their flesh. This is how people live who don't really look for the return of Jesus. Beginning this morning and into this evening, we're going to be looking at verses that give us something additional, an additional nuance. It's describing the same life. It will really help you to keep that in mind, that each of these parables, each of these illustrations is simply advancing the ball, just simply giving us one more look at this kind of life. And now we're meeting with readiness in the terms of preparation. For the past two sermons, we've, we've 
been challenged with the thought, are we awake? This morning and this evening, we're going to be challenged with the thought, are we prepared? Are we prepared? Because that's what this parable, parable of the ten virgins, emphasizes. Five virgins are prepared. Five virgins are not prepared. And so this is the question we are confronted with. Are we prepared to meet with the bridegroom? Are we prepared to meet with the second coming of Christ? And one of the striking things throughout this entire discourse is that Jesus is teaching us these things in a way that impresses upon us how vitally important this really is. I think I said it a couple of weeks ago, we, we talk about all the things that are important for our sanctification, we talk about Bible study and prayer, and we talk about the gathering of the saints and the importance of the local church and all those things are vital and, and essential. But what is not mentioned often enough is the fact that, that sanctification requires a life fixed on our hope. It requires a life fixed on the meeting our, our Savior face to face. It, it is a life lived in the expectation of the return of Jesus. And if we examine every you know, past week as we meet together on Sundays and ask, how often was that really on my mind? That this age is temporal and the age that is coming is eternal and I'm going to meet with my Savior face to face, I think we would discover that we struggle to stay in that mindset and yet it's vital for our sanctification. Well, Jesus is teaching this in a way that doesn't allow us to ignore Him. He's teaching this in a way that just is impressing upon us again and again how vital this is. In fact, He, he does it in a no, number of different ways. Let me mention a few ways that, that He's saying to us, you've got to stop, you've got to slow down, you've got to hear me doesn't allow us to ignore him. How does he do this? Well, he does it, first of all, by repetition. As I said, each of these parables, illustrations that follow one upon another, it's just an additional step forward. He's saying, in effect, let me tell this to you again. Let me tell it to you in a different way. Let me add some additional nuance, but let me tell you again so that you have this, this great volume of information about the return of Jesus in the answer to a question that his disciples gave him. I said it to you earlier, we'll remind you again this morning, this is the longest recorded answer to a question from Jesus that we have in the biblical record. He, he takes a lot of time to answer this question and the Holy Spirit of God devotes a lot of space to preserving his answers. That says to us, this is important. When a teacher wants you to hold on to something, he repeats himself. He says it in different ways. He turns it over in different ways. But what he's trying to do is, is cement what you're hearing in your mind and in your heart. That's what Jesus is doing here. He also emphasizes the importance of all of this in the solemn manner that he uses. Because if you've been listening, you, you've been noting that more than once he says things like, truly, I say to you. I want you to tune in. I want you to open your ears. I want you to understand you can count on this. You can take this to the bank. You can stake your life on it. And so he repeats that sort of phrase over and over again throughout the discourse. Truly I say to you. So with a solemn manner, he wants you to hear it. You know, someone who really wants you to hear something, they're not joking. <laughs> they bring you down to the level of seriousness. Listen to what I'm saying. That's what Jesus does here. He also emphasizes the importance of this teaching by means of illustration. If you're concerned that your hearers are, are really understanding, what do you do? You don't just say it to them, you show it to them. And that's what Jesus does here. He, he says many things in a very straightforward way, but then what does he do? He goes on to illustrate it through parable after parable after parable. If you didn't get it this way, perhaps you'll get it this way. If you didn't hear me this time, maybe you'll hear me through this picture I'm about to give you. So he's not just saying it to us, he's showing it to us. That says it's very important that we grasp it. But the final way I'll mention that he drives home the importance of this instruction is by warning. By warning. He could teach us about his second coming 
in, in a way that's entirely positive. He could have taught us about his second coming in a way that was merely exhortative to his people, but he doesn't do that. Each time he is underscoring how devastating the consequences are if you're not awake. He is making clear for us that this is the difference between salvation and damnation. The consequences couldn't be any more serious. The instruction, therefore, couldn't be any more weighty. You dare not turn a deaf ear to what he's saying because it's your soul that is at stake. And it's that emphasis that's on display in our verses this morning. What we meet with in verses 1 through 13 of chapter 25 is a warning parable. It's a story that centers on preparation for a wedding. It contrasts those who were ready for their role in the wedding and those who were not ready, not prepared for their role in the wedding. And what is really especially emphasized at the end of the story is the finality of all of it. There was a time to be prepared. But if you're not prepared during the time to be prepared, once that time has been wasted, there is no more opportunity. Once the bridegroom comes, once the bridegroom's voice is heard, once the call has been issued, it's done. And those who were prepared enter into the wedding feast, and those who were not prepared are left outside. This is a warning about preparation. And an assurance that the time to be prepared is limited. So don't waste it. We'll look at this parable under two main headings. Preparation illustrated, then preparation exhorted. Preparation illustrated, verses 1 through 12. Preparation exhorted, verse 13. The first thing we see is the life of preparation illustrated. Let's just understand the story. Let's read it again, beginning at verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven may be compared to ten virgins. Notice he says, then the kingdom of heaven. He's just carrying on from the previous instruction. Be ready for his coming. Be awake. Be alert. Here's another way to say it. Then the kingdom of heaven may be compared. When the, when the king returns, ushers in his kingdom, it's going to be like this, like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, saying, No, there will not be enough for us, and you too go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Now this is a, a parable, a story meant to teach some very specific truths. It is not an allegory. You're going to go astray. If you attempt to take every detail in the story and spiritualize it, you know, I wonder what this means or what that means and make it something spiritual, uh, a spiritual uh, parallel with everything you read here. That's not the point of the story. In fact, everything the story illustrates, Jesus has already taught in straightforward terms. If you want to understand the parable, think about what Jesus has already taught. Then you'll come to the parable, the story, and you're going to see what you have here is not new information. What you have here is an illustration 
of what you've already been given in terms of information. And so he's simply picturing the very lessons that he's already taught us. The story centers on the wedding customs of the day of Christ. I want to say we don't have exhaustive knowledge of those marriage customs. It bothers me sometimes when preachers go beyond what we can know for certain and act like they know with certainty what this means or that means when we there are scholars who will admit we don't have a perfect knowledge of their marriage customs, but we do have a general knowledge of them and a good enough knowledge of them to be able to get the lessons, and that's the point, to get the lessons. The story takes us to the night of the wedding feast. A betrothal has already taken place a long time before. The bride has been waiting for this night when the bridegroom will come and take her to be with him. His coming leads to a procession that others will participate in. That procession will take them to the wedding feast. The virgins that are spoken of will participate in some way in that procession. We probably will go astray if we think about these maidens as uh, attendance of the bride in the same way that you think of attendance of the bride in our wedding customs. Uh, many people participated in a wedding procession. So the, all he's saying is these young women had a role to play in the procession. They were invited to participate in the procession. Virgins, this is to say they were young women of marriable age, but they were not yet married, expected to be chaste. The general time of the bridegroom's coming is known. This is what, how they're able to go out to meet him. The general time of his coming is known, but the exact hour of his coming is not known. So that those who are going to be in this procession need to be prepared uh, to carry out their role all the way to the wedding feast, regardless of the time when he arrives. Those who are envisioned as participating in this procession would have been invited you didn't do this without being invited. They would have responded positively to the invitation so that they're all associated with those who will be in the wedding feast. In terms of their external appearance prior to his arrival, they all are expecting to be in that wedding feast. But they are all not the same. And when the moment of crisis arrives... There's a division that occurs between those who were prepared and those who were not prepared. Those who expected to be in the wedding feast and are, and those who expected to be in the wedding feast and will not be there. So what happens? Verse 1, they all go out to wait for the bridegroom. Verse 2, some of them were wise, some of them were foolish. Verses 3 and 4, the wise and the foolish are distinguished by preparation. The lamp, he talks about in verse 3 and in verse 4, is a torch. The oil that he refers to was used to saturate the rags on the torches so that they would remain lit. Uh, th these, these torches, that the oil would burn off rather quickly, and so you had to keep supplying oil for the torches to remain lit. The wise maidens had prepared by bringing flasks of oil. The foolish virgins didn't bring any. In other words, they didn't make any preparation for the bridegroom coming at an hour that they did not expect. They were not prepared for delay. Verse 5, the bridegroom was delayed. Late at night, at midnight, verse 6, the moment of crisis arrives. At midnight, there was a shout, behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all the virgins, verse 7, move to order their torches. When it says they trimmed their lamps, the word for trimmed there, cosmeo, has to do with ordering something. So they all move to order their torches. And the foolish recognize, verse 8, because of the delay, because he's come so late, they don't have enough oil. 
to keep their torches lit through the entirety of the procession. And so what do they do? They, they ask for the wise virgins to share their oil. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered saying, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. This is not a lesson about strategic selfishness. <laughs> what it's saying is preparation can't be transferred to someone else. You can't prepare. You can't expect for someone to prepare for you. If they had given away their oil, now no one is prepared. No one fulfills what was required. So no, we can't share with you. You're going to have to go to the dealers and get some oil. And that, of course, leads to this separation, this division at the wedding feast. Verse 10, while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. So there's the story. Again, not giving us new information, as I'll show you in just a moment, but simply illustrating what Jesus has already taught. He's, he's not just saying it to us. He's showing it to us. So let's examine the story for these lessons. There's seven I want to point out. Seven things Jesus has taught that he now illustrates with this parable. Lesson number one, not everybody associated with the kingdom will enter the kingdom. Not everyone associated with the kingdom is ready to meet the king. Not everyone associated, associated with the kingdom is ready to meet the bridegroom, prepared to meet the bridegroom. To take the picture and apply it to reality, we can say that the invitations for the, for the, for the wedding day the invitations for the kingdom arrival have been issued. They've gone forth in the form of gospel preaching. And there are some who will not be in the kingdom. There are some who will not be in the wedding feast who have responded to those invitations positively. They seem to have accepted the invitation externally. But not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, really belongs to the Lord. Verse 11, the other versions came saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. By the way, you, you see this. In this parable, some of what Jesus talks about would have been the common experience of people at a wedding feast. Some of what he talks about goes beyond the common experience to make clear he's talking about what he's already taught. He's talking about his own coming. He's talking about his own people because at a wedding feast, this shutting of the door and the cry out of Lord, Lord is not what you would have expected. No, this is teaching us about what happens when the bridegroom arrives. And there are some who've been associated with his kingdom, right? They're there with the virgins who are going to be in the wedding feast. Everybody looks the same externally. They all have torches, but not everyone has oil. Not everyone's prepared. And so some will enter in and some will not. And the ones who do not enter in were associated with everything. You would have thought they'd be present, but they're not going to be present. The door will be shut to them. So lesson one is not everyone associated with the kingdom is ready for it. Not everyone's prepared. We sit here this morning in this church building, everyone professing faith in Christ who is a member of this church. But we know, don't we, from Scripture, and from our own experience as we now live years as believers and we watch what happens with people's lives. You ever do this? You ever go back and look at a picture from like 20 years ago of people who profess to be believers along with you and you go, this one's not there, this one's not there, this one's no longer walking with the Lord, this one has denied the faith. The truth is we all profess to be prepared, but some of us are not prepared in this room. We'll talk more about the preparation in just a moment. Second lesson. Readiness to meet the king or readiness to meet the bridegroom, readiness for the kingdom of heaven is an individual matter. 
We're prepared one life at a time, one soul at a time. Being prepared to meet Jesus is not something that is transferable. Will you share your oil with us? No. Because then we're not prepared. We prepared. You had to prepare. I prepared. You have to prepare. Can't transfer this. R.T. France commented, he said, trimmed their lamps is literally put their torches in order. They are lighting them for the procession. A well-soaked torch would burn for a quarter of an hour or so, but those with no oil were sooner lit than they went out. The rebuff given by the wise to the foolish is not a charter for selfish unconcern for others, but is pre its presence in the parable may be intended to remind us that no one can ultimately rely on another's preparedness. The formal finality of the door was shut Again, hardly fits the atmosphere of a village wedding, but effectively makes the point that there's a too late in God's timetable. Is that a part of your theology? Do you see that? There's a too late in God's timetable. So all these virgins appeared to be ready, but only some of them had truly prepared What does it mean to be ready? James Boyce gives us Charles Spurgeon on this point. I want us to hear Spurgeon in a moment, but first hear what Boyce says about this. He says, don't be sidetracked by trying to work out the, me the meaning of the oil. Some have identified the oil as the Holy Spirit because the Spirit is sometimes symbolized by oil in Scripture. But if we do that, we're going to think that a person can have the Holy Spirit and then run out of him, as it were, or that when one runs out, he or she needs to get more. The right thing is to forget about the oil entirely and think only about being ready. But what does it mean to be ready? And then he gives us Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon saw it as an interchange brought about by regeneration or new birth. He wrote, drawing on a good deal of Bible imagery, and here's Spurgeon, a great change has to be wrought in you far beyond any power of yours to accomplish before you can go in with Christ to the marriage. You must, first of all, be renewed in your nature or you will not be ready. You must be washed from your sins or you will not be ready. You must be justified in Christ's righteousness and you must put on His wedding dress or else you will not be ready. You must be reconciled to God. You must be made like to God or you will not be ready. Or to come to the parable before us, you must have a lamp and that lamp must be fed with heavenly oil and it must, be, must continue to burn brightly or else you will not be ready. No child of darkness can go into that place of light. You must be brought out of nature's darkness into God's marvelous light or else you will never be ready to go in with Christ to the marriage and to be forever with him, close quote. And to say it succinctly, you must be saved. You must be regenerate. You must be born again. That's what Spurgeon is saying. And he's right. That's the preparation that Jesus continues to illustrate. This is why the consequences distinguish between the saved and the lost. Are you awake? Well, are you saved or are you lost? Are you prepared? Well, are you saved or are you lost? Have you been transformed down to the, to, the, to the level of your very nature so that now you're in the light, whereas before you were in the darkness? Is there that heavenly oil, as it were, keeping your torch aflame? Or does your light go out over time, demonstrating you never had any oil that was sufficient to meet with the bridegroom? So, lesson one, not everybody associated with the kingdom is ready for it. Lesson two, readiness for the kingdom of heaven is an individual matter. I want to say this clearly. Listen to me, young people. Your mother and father can't save you. Your grandparents can't save you. Husband, wife, your spouse can't save you. Dear friend, your friendships can't save you. You can spend your time in the company of Christian people your whole life and then be in hell. You can live your life in a Christian family and then be in hell. You can be married to a believer 
and then be in hell. This is non-transferable. Are you, you prepared to meet Jesus? Have you been born again? Do, do, do you know what it is to have a new life, a new nature, because of God's gracious saving work in your soul that granted you repentance and faith in Jesus so that you're a new creation in Christ? Are you prepared before the bridegroom arrives? Third lesson from the parable. Preparation must be made before it is too late. Preparation must be made before it is too late. Once the crisis moment arrived, once the bridegroom's voice was heard, it was settled. It was too late for these unprepared virgins to go get oil. There was a time to prepare. The wise virgins had prepared. The foolish virgins had not. And once the time expired, there was no more time. Fourth lesson. This is one that Jesus continues to emphasize. The bridegroom will come at a time when he's not expected. There is a time when the time for preparation expires and you don't know when that time is. There's a time to get ready. And once it is past, it's past, but you don't know when there's no more time. What does that mean? It means you must be prepared now. It means, as the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. If you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Today, now, is the time to be saved. You must always be prepared. Because you don't know when He's coming. Now, in the parable, when the, when the bridegroom was delayed... Do you notice they all slept? Verse 5, now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. I don't think our Lord included that in the parable for no reason. I think there's actually something really wonderful there. It's, it's a reminder that being prepared and being watchful is not a radical denial of human realities that we all experience until the bridegroom comes. Right? People get sleepy. And in the parable, that's not associated with evil. It's not like the wise virgins stayed awake and the foolish virgins fell asleep. That would have belonged to an earlier kind of teaching, this emphasizing staying awake. Here he's emphasizing being prepared. So everybody gets sleepy, everybody sleeps. The difference was when the wise virgins went to sleep, they were ready. When the foolish virgins went to sleep, they were, they were still unprepared. One group went to sleep ready. One group went to sleep completely not ready. And if you take that one aspect of human reality, sleepiness, and you apply it now to, to a larger picture of humanness until we meet with Jesus, we can say there's a sense in which we all take our sleep until Jesus arrives. We have daily business to attend to. We have temporal responsibilities that the Lord has assigned to us and, and can't be ignored and remain faithful to Him. You go to work on Monday. You take care of the financial and physical needs of your, of your family. You, you, you have gatherings. There are weddings and, and birthdays and things that we celebrate. Life does go on. And we're meant to live that life until Jesus returns. But we, believers, live that life awake to His return, prepared to meet Him. We work while we're watching. We're watching while we work. But there are some people who go about their daily business, who think they're going to be in the wedding feast, but they are entirely deceived. They are not ready to meet with the bridegroom. And when the time comes, when the crisis time arrives, that you had to be ready, there's going to be a great division that occurs. Had the foolish virgins in this story known the outcome, 
then when the wise virgins were sleeping, they would have already been on their way to the suppliers to get oil. Instead, they sleep just like the wise virgins sleep, and then when the moment of crisis arrives, it's too late. What am I saying to you this morning? I'm saying you better be prepared while you have the opportunity to prepare. Because you don't know when the time is going to arrive that, you're, that the preparation is now, you were either ready or you were not. And while the illustration here is, the, is meant to, to remind us of the second coming of Christ, the, the truth of the matter is your death will represent the end of your opportunity just as surely as the second coming of Christ will. The day you close your eyes in death, you have no more opportunity. You say, when is my time to, pre to prepare? Answer, while you're alive on this side of eternity. Do you know when you're going to die? Do you know anyone who, who died unexpectedly? You ever known someone like that? They went out one day, and it, the, the fact that this was their last day was not on their mind. And then they were gone. Do you understand? This is not a fear tactic. This is a fact. That could be you today. That could be me. We gather again this evening at 6.30. It is absolutely true to say, I might not be here. You might not be here. You may take your last breath on this planet before we meet again at 6.30. And there will be no more opportunity beyond that. When the bridegroom's voice calls, that's it. Your time for preparation has passed. And, he, and you don't know when he's coming. So we're, we're not people who sit around looking to the skies, are we? You know, I, I'm not going to go to work. I mean, this, this was the problem in Thessalonica. This is something Paul actually had to correct in a New Testament letter. People who had misunderstood the return of Christ in a way that they were living lives of passivity. We're going to see tonight in the next parable that follows, the parable of the talents, that the life of being prepared is not a life of inactivity. It's a life of investment. So we don't sit around and say, I'm just waiting for Jesus to return. No, we go about our daily business just like people sleep question is, are you, are you ready, though, for his return, even while you go about your daily business? And are you working and watching at the same time? Fifth lesson. I've alluded to this already, but let me just underscore it. Once the bridegroom comes, destinies are settled. Once the bridegroom comes, destinies are settled. How many people live as though there will be no end to their opportunities for preparation. How many people live as though the, the day of grace is forever? Interesting way that Jesus describes this in the story. When he says in verse 10, the door was shut. The door was shut. Just as surely as God shut the door on Noah's ark, when men and women perished in their sin, in the great flood, one day the door of salvation's opportunity will be shut. And when it's shut, those on the outside will be left outside. There is no more opportunity, no second chance. So God has given you today the opportunity to be saved, the opportunity to place your faith in Christ. To be sure that you're prepared. Are you wise or are you foolish if you say to yourself, well, I'll consider that. I'll think about that some more down the road. I'm young. I'm 25 years old. I don't have to make that decision today. What a, what a morbid way to live your life, thinking about the end of your existence. No, I'll, I'll consider this later on. When I'm old, old, like Richard, 60 years old. I mean, what? <laughs> Well, I'm way down the road, I'll think about this. Is that wise or is that foolish? Who knows? Maybe these foolish virgins thought that they had time to go get oil if they ran out. 
but they didn't. Now, once the bridegroom arrives, it's, it's done. Sixth lesson. Jesus consistently represents this kind of unprepared person as shocked by their destiny. Maybe this is the most sobering point for us as we consider all this teaching. The people who are represented in, in these stories, these parables, when they, are, when they are left outside, they are shocked. In this case, they're crying, Lord, Lord. Verse 11, Lord, Lord, open up for us. Open up for us. Later, when we get to the final judgment, look down at verse 31. When you get to the final judgment, we'll follow the next parable that we'll look at tonight. When you get to the final judgment, and, and the Lord speaks to those who are going to be put into, out, into the outer darkness forever. Verse 41, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. And on he goes, verse 40, 44, then they themselves also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Lord, when was that? Right? They're surprised. They're shocked. How does that happen? How does it happen there are people left outside the wedding feast who thought they would be inside? How does it happen there are people separated from the sheep? They're the goats, but they thought they were a sheep. How does that happen? One way I know for certain that it happens is people are willing to be dishonest with themselves about the fruits of regeneration. What does it mean to be prepared? It means you're regenerate. It means you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, that, what that means is we all, we all do well to look at ourselves and ask, am I regenerate? Am I prepared? But to do that kind of examination, you're not doing it in a vacuum, are you? It's not like, well, I, kinda, I feel regenerate. No, that's not the standard. Rather, what do you do? You go to the, to the Word of God and you say, what characterizes regenerate people? You don't, want, you don't want your friend's testimony about whether or not you're saved. You don't want your mother or father's testimony about whether or not you're saved. You want the Holy Spirit's testimony. His Spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. Well, how does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit? Answer, Scripture. He takes you to the Word of God and He says, do you see? This is you. And so one of the ways that people are deceived is they don't, they don't deal honestly with themselves in light of that testimony. Say it another way, the Bible gives us enough information that if you're listening, you can recognize if you're deceived. If you're willing to recognize that you've been deceived. And so people say, I have the fruits of regeneration when the Bible says they don't. New life results in new loves. Do you have the new loves that belong to the new life? New life results in new appetites. Do you have the appetites that belong to salvation? How many people think they're going to spend eternity in a world that represents everything they have no desire for right now? That's a recipe for deception, isn't it? I mean, when I get to heaven... I'll love heavenly things. I don't have any desire for them right now. But when I get there, I will. What a recipe for self-deception. Do you love Jesus now? Do you love God's Word now? Do you love God's church now? Do you desire holiness now. Are you putting away sin? Now. Are you confessing your sins and repenting of them? Now. Do you know humility? 
Is that what characterizes your life? The Lord teaching you, lowering you in your own estimation, seeing the greatness of God and the greatness of your Savior and the lowliness of yourself. Are you knowing that now? Do you want to spend your life on behalf of the Master now? Do you say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Can you say that now? Do you find your fellowship with people who think like that? Or are you that person who's always finding his fellowship with the people who don't think like that? Where are you most comfortable? Where is your friendship at? Well, if you're not willing to be honest with yourself, when, you, when those kinds of questions are, are brought to us by the Word of God, well, there's, there's how you end up one day saying, Lord, Lord, let me in. I don't know you. Why are you telling me to go away? When did I do those things that you say I didn't do? Or when did I refuse those things you say I refused? How, how do people end up deceived? Answer, they, they're not honest with themselves about the fruits of regeneration. So quickly to review, six lessons we've seen. Number one, not everybody associated with the kingdom is ready for it. Number two, readiness for the kingdom of heaven is an individual matter, can't be transferred. Number three, preparation must be made before it's too late. Number four, the bridegroom will come at a time when he's not expected. Number five, once the bridegroom comes, destinies are fixed. Number six, Jesus consistently represents this kind of unprepared person as shocked by their destiny. Seventh lesson, last one. Those who are not ready are those whom the Lord does not know. Those who are not ready are those whom the Lord does not know. But he answered, verse 12, truly, there's that solemn manner again, truly, I say to you, take this to the bank. I tell you this in the truth, I don't know you. Doesn't mean he doesn't know about them. It means they're not his. It means that he's had no saving fellowship with them. And what that means for us is when we examine salvation, we're never meant to examine it coldly. What does it mean to be saved? It means you have now been reconciled to God. It means you have a personal, biblical knowledge of the Lord. Salvation is personal. Salvation is devotional. To know Jesus is to be devoted to Jesus, it's to love Him. It's loving knowledge. And so the question is, do you know the Master? Not do you know about Him? Have you been taught about Him? Can you give me some truths about Him? Do you know the gospel? No, do you know Him? So that you can know biblically and by the testimony of God's Spirit that He knows you. It's possible for you to name Jesus as your Lord and Savior but he will not name you as his child. That happens again when your approach to him is superficial. It's not genuine. It's not sincere. A, a spirit produced godly sorrow that brings you to turn from your life of sin to give your life to Christ. No one who comes to Jesus that way will ever be turned away. I want you to be clear about this. this what, what I'm talking about is not someone who is sincerely, genuinely, with a heart broken over his or her sins, turned to Christ for life, and then Jesus says, no, I just want, I want, I want to deceive you until the day that you find out you've been deceived. No, not at all. No, what this is talking about is the kind of person that superficially responds positively to an invitation then doesn't even put forth the effort to be prepared for the procession. This is the person who says, I know Jesus, but they come and sit in church every Sunday, and that's the full extent of their relationship to Jesus. Or they, they spend their time with Christian people, but the thing that animates those Christian people, the oil, as it were, that keeps their torch of flame, you don't, you're a stranger to that. You don't know anything about that kind of motivation that is salvation-produced and holy in its nature. 
No, no, this, the, the only way to be deceived is to turn a deaf ear to the Bible's testimony about what salvation really looks like. I'm asking you, have you been honest with yourself and heard the biblical testimony and said, thank you, God, you have had mercy upon me and made me that person? Or do you, would you have to say, I say I'm that person, but there's no real evidence that I am that person. In which case, what should you do? You cry out to the Lord for what is real. Oh, Lord, save my soul. I still remember when the Lord brought me to that point, 16 years old, summer between my junior and senior years of high school. I'd professed to be a believer since I was seven years old. Once my family began to be in church regularly, uh, I, you, you quickly learn the lingo and you begin to learn verses of Scripture. And before you know it, you're involved in ministry, things that, that young people do at churches, and everybody assumes you're a believer. And to some extent, you even try to convince yourself that you're a one because now all I've done is added information to, to the prayer that I prayed when I was seven and the baptism that I underwent when I was seven. Never mind the fact that all the motivations that really belong to Christianity were absent from my soul all those years. So that when I was at that summer camp, when I was 16 years old, I didn't even know enough to know how to rightly put into words what I was experiencing. But I, I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't know if I am saved or not, but I know this. I now know what it means to follow your son. And if I am not saved, would you save me? And my life changed. And I looked back and began to recognize that is when regeneration was real. That's when I was a new creation in Christ. And for all of my ups and downs and for all of my times when I'm warmer and times when I'm colder and all the things we go through as believers, that love for Jesus, that desire to please him, that love for his people, that love for his word has never gone away. Why? Because that's what God produces when he saves someone. Those who are not ready are those whom the Lord does not know. So preparation illustrated. Are you awake? Another way to say it, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Final point this morning, notice Verse 13, this preparation is then exhorted. It's exhorted. Verse 13, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And what I want to emphasize here is ask yourself this question, who is the Lord exhorting? Who is he exhorting? He's exhorting his disciples. And we might say to ourselves, Lord, why, knowing that the outcome is salvation or damnation, why would you exhort disciples to stay awake? I mean, isn't this a word for the lost? Well, remember something. First of all, among the Lord's disciples at this time, you still have Judas. So the, the exhortation regarding salvation and damnation certainly applies. Judas is there. But there's something else, and you heard it in the Scripture reading this morning when Pastor John was reading from the book of Hebrews. God's people are warned. The warning passages are given to the church. The warnings passages are given to believers. Why? Precisely because the Lord knows we have ears to hear. That is, the warnings passages of the Word of God will always prove effectual in the lives of people who are saved. They wake us up. They do their work. They bring us back to that place where we are able to say, Lord, by your grace and mercy and love and kindness, I am prepared. And I don't belong to this world. I don't want to live for this passing age. And I do want to live for your son. And I do want to be expended for the master. They wake us up. These warnings are effectual in the lives of saved people. So I want to say, if you're awake, wake up. 
if you're asleep, be saved before it's too late. Be prepared before the time to be prepared passes. Don't presume you're going to know the day or the hour. Your life could end today. Are you ready? Are you ready? Make sure your torch has oil. And the church would say, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the ways that you warn us. Thank you for the ears that you have granted us so that your warnings land with us. They do their work in our hearts. Your warnings save us in that sense. You have saved us and you're saving us, preserving us. And your warnings, Lord, explain our perseverance and our preservation. We give you praise. Pray for every believer hearing me that, Lord, this would be a day when we are more awake than we were when we walked in. That we would remain vigilant, alert, ready, prepared to meet with our Savior. For the bridegroom's voice, for the bridegroom's call. And I pray for every soul hearing me who doesn't yet know your son. Maybe some who've been associated with the wedding feast, but they won't be in it. May this be the day when you have mercy upon them and make them alive. Wake them up for the first time. Grant them a genuine salvation. The only one that will answer for the day, the, the, the salvation that you grant, Lord, would you save them through faith in your son Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.